My name is Daryl Budge. I'm the WA State Director for Family Voice Australia. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about pro-life conversations, and I'm going to speak through two different topics about euthanasia and about the abortion issue. So um, thanks for being here today, and uh, let's start off with some Bible verses. Uh, the biblical truth about this, this topic, whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed, for in the image of God has God made mankind. So this is how serious the issue of life and death is when it comes to taking human life. God says in his Old Testament command, he will say it's authorized that by, hum by humans your blood shall be shed, and that's how serious he takes it. He says in Exodus 20 that you shall not murder. He says the Lord himself, he's the one who brings death and makes alive, so therefore he's the only one that's authorized to take innocent life. He's the only one that holds that key, and um, it's him that appoints our days. And he speaks about children in Matthew 18. Jesus says, If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it's better that they be a millstone be put around their head and drowned in the depths of the sea. And he says that's how serious it is to affect one of these little ones that he loves. And he says, Those ones, they believe in me and I care for them. One of the issues that when we think about the issue of euthanasia and about abortion, the, the, the concept here is a bit like what Job's wife said to Job. He said, she said, when you're suffering, just curse God and die. When, when pain is going wrong and things are going wrong in your life, just, just curse God and just give up. And secondly, when it comes to the issue of abortion, the idea expressed here is, you, you shall die for my comfort. And when a mother is feeling in that time of angst and anxiety and pressure from her employer and others, she's saying to this child and to a society around this, this person must die so that I may have a life a life that of comfort. And versus the Christian message, what, what God says to us is, take up your cross and follow me. This is what Jesus says to us. Take up your cross, live a self-sacrificial life where you love and care for others. Now, the, the concept within our society is, is it's completely separated the personhood of who you are from what you are in your biological essence. And this is a concept developed by Nancy Piercy in her book, Love Thy Body. And she, she talks about this. She says, we've, we've separated the legal essence or the subjective essence or the rights that we have, who we are, from biologically who we are. So when it comes to the issue of abortion, we're only attributing a legal right for, to human life when we decide. Not because they're a member of the human family, but because when we as a society decide, we want to give them that right. And in the reverse, that happens with euthanasia. When somebody says, I no longer have the capacities or, or the things that I used to be able to do before, or I experienced pain, I should be able to have the right to compel somebody else to help me to commit suicide. Because I want to give up. My, my essence is only dependent upon what I can do or, who I, I, or what I'm able to do legally in my life. And, and it becomes very extremely subjective for them. So when we think about the grace and truth perspective on the end of life, let's think about the definitions here. Euthanasia is something that's induced by a doctor, and it's a general term that covers all-encompassing. All Euthanasia it actually just means, in Greek, a good death. Now, assisted suicide is a subset of that, and that's when you yourself take it as a self-administered powder. And our legalisation in WA has authorised... Euthanasia and assisted suicide. In Victoria, we only have a self-administered uh, powder, so only self-administration in Victoria. Now, there's about five inquiries every week in Victoria into administering this suicide poison. In WA, with, with the authorising just class four and class six poisons, and the combination of how we're going to do this poison hasn't even yet been determined. And it's going to be into law and actually enacted later on in mid-2021. Now, there's other terms that the debate uses. Uh, proponents of euthanasia talk about aid in dying or medical aid in dying or dying with dignity or physician-assisted di dying. This is all nice narrative terms, nice colourful, um, illustrative uh, pictures to put over the top of what the reality is. This is suicide and this is what they're advocating. Now, all these terms that they use equally apply to palliative care practices. So in the reality, euthanasia is this. It's a kit that you get in Victoria. This is what you get. You get some anti-nausea pills, some anti-anxiety pills, just in case you feel extremely anxious on the day. And then after you've taken the anti-nausea pill to make sure you don't throw up, 
then you've got to mix this powder on the spot right there and then make sure you take it very quickly. And in addition to that, you've then got to spend the next 10, 20 minutes made sure that you're sitting up, otherwise if you fall over a little bit, you're going to throw up or some part of the poison will exit your body and it won't take its full effect. So somebody's got to be present to make sure you stay sitting up. This is the reality of euthanasia when it's self-administered. When it's administered by a doctor, it may mean that in other countries especially, the doctor may hold you down and make sure you take it. And that's the reality of euthanasia. That's what it actually is. Euthanasia then is not, according to the Australian Medical Association, it's not not initiating and not continuing life-prolonging measures. It's not treatment or action intended to relieve symptoms, which may have a secondary consequence of hastening death. So refusing a treatment or something that... Um, a treatment or action that is intended to relieve your symptoms, that's not euthanasia. And you have that right, that's a choice that you have. Now let's think about the alternative. What is the alternative that we as Christians and as society are proposing? Well, there is already effective palliative care. Now palliative care, according to the WA Department of Health, even in their decade-long end-of-life strategy, and of course to the, according to the AMAWA, they say palliative care is a human right and is a fundamental to improving the quality of life, well-being and dignity of all Australians, all of individuals. And it, it involves these choices about therapy, about futile treatment, declining it, about the place of the dying, about symptom relief, and about refusing prolonged dying process. And it, it gives you an opportunity for a closure of goodbyes, of forgiveness and reconciliation, all these important things that you might want to experience and go through, and having that as much time as possible with your loved ones. Silver Chain provides in-home palliative care across Perth. There's seven specialist wards across parts of WA. Now, it needs to be much better funded and much further afield, but it is commonly available, and it's so effective in terms of um, pain relief that's not effective is extremely rare. And in, here in WA, one of the problems we have is we underfund palliative care. We only have one-third of the specialists by national spe benchmarks. We have one-third of the palliative care beds, according to national benchmarks. And WA and Victoria have the lowest funding per capita of or anywhere in Australia. And it's no surprise then that we're two of the first states to want to institute this kind of terrible system. According to the WA Palliative Medicine Specialist Group, we need $100 million a year in extra funding for facilities and resources besides the staff funding. We need significant extra funding to make sure we care for people properly in Christian care and a comprehensive care as a society. Now, Voluntary Assisted Dying Act was passed here in WA back in December last year. Now, it's now entered an administrative phase that will end in mid-2021, and the Health Minister and the Department are creating some non-legislative procedures. Now, we're investigating how these procedures are working out and what poisons they're choosing to administer in this and how pharmacists are going to be authorised to administer the poison and who's going to be the contact person, who's going to take the poison, who, how is it going to be stored properly, all of those kinds of things. And now there's a lot of issues with this bill and I'll go through some of them. It was passed 21 votes to 11 and here's some five problems with, this, with the law that was passed in December. A patient can self-administer the poison without any supervision. So amendments were, were moved that they would have some supervision, some doctor, somebody present to make sure that nothing goes wrong. But the uh, majority Labor government voted down that, that measure. Doctors are compelled to falsify the death certificate. So this has deep problems for our society, for health records, for insurance records, all sorts of things that the person's underlying condition is suddenly magically on the death certificate as the cause of death, even though they took a poison um, to sh cut short their life. Medical staff who conscientiously object will be forced to provide information on how to access the scheme. Unlike in Victoria, they can say, I don't want to even, even provide information. There's no requirement to store the lethal substance securely. Doctors are not prohibited from steering patients towards suicide. In Victoria, they... they they are made to make sure they don't say anything towards the patient unless the patient asks them a direct question. And here in WA, even when other palliative care options are available, the doctor can talk to, to the patient about those issues and steer them towards that. And according to their legislation, all that means is they can't directly influence the patient. So they can encourage the patient to think about this more, but all they're, all they're able to do is 
they, they just can't supposedly influence, but it's kind of dodgy about what the, what the distinction is. So the reasons to reject euthanasia are five here. Firstly, it devalues life, particularly for the disabled, for people who are depressed, for people who are losing ability later on in life. I mean, think about um, the 102-year-old doctor here in Perth. He went over to the Netherlands to take his life. The only thing that was wrong with him is he couldn't do his golf swing properly. He couldn't walk around the same as he used to. And he had great fun- mental faculties, but he was encouraged by euthanasia performance to go and take his life overseas. Uh, here's Sam O'Connor in the picture there. She's a disability advocate. I met her and she tells a story of going to a particular event and she holds up a sign saying, I want some support, I want some funding to think about taking my life. And she's there sitting with a wheelchair. And people were coming up to her and saying, yeah, man, this, you're in such a terrible situation. I'd like to help you along that way. I'd like to give you some money. And they weren't asking her, why does she want to commit suicide? What's wrong with her? How, how can I care for you? How can I support you? There was this assumption in society that just because somebody is in a wheelchair, that therefore they should be encouraged to think about suicide. And this is where our society, unfortunately, is going with this kind of um, personhood theory and, and these, um, this change of mind about the value of life. Secondly, it promotes suicide. Thirdly, consent will be compromised a Pandora's box will be opened of lots of other flow-on issues, and there's risks to our Aboriginal community as well. So in the, thinking about devaluing life, this idea that you're losing ability or, or you're depressed, unrelievable pain is extremely rare, according to the research. Here, in, Thinking about research in Oregon, it says 92% they, they just wanted euthanasia because it was losing autonomy. 96% of the people surveyed in there in 2015 thought... This is the reason, the top reason for me is I'm losing ability. And pain wasn't even in the top five. So it's not that euthanasia restrict, is requested because of pain, it's because of lots of other cultural and societal issues, the messaging that they're getting, the devaluing of life. In reality, what they're not being told is there's tremendous complications uh, out there when you take poison and you take it in a way that's not well supervised and it's very highly likely you're going to have a complication distressing symptoms in in Oregon or in 3% of all cases and the dying with dignity claim is supposedly 4% of the people are dying in terrible pain and they need and they're committing suicide in, in great numbers but the idea what they're saying is that they've looked at research and they've taken the worst kind of provision of palliative care and averaged across all of the institutions. Instead of looking at the best of institutions, which have fantastic, great palliative care and they have less than 0.5%, vanishing small numbers of people that have pain that just isn't able to be managed in a safe way, but they, they, they boost up this large figure. And they're not told about an Oregon lumberjack that had, was take, took the poison and after three days in a coma, he wakes up and realises it didn't work. And then 14 days later, he then finally passes away of his actual natural condition. In the Netherlands retrospective analysis, they found 7% experienced unexpected side effects, they regained consciousness, they were vomiting, they were gasping for breath and they had seizures. So it's, it's terrible to think about this is what people are not being told. The, the thought then from the, the people that are requesting this, they're, they're people who have strong mental faculties. They have strong desires about what they want with their life. People like Henry Rush, a famous neurosurgeon in the UK, and he says this, they argue that grannies will be made to commit suicide, but even if a few grannies get bullied into it, isn't that the price worth paying for all the people like me who could die with dignity? He has very little concern for people who are going to be pressured into it, are being told to think you should commit suicide when you lose your ability. For him, it's ultimate control over his life. He's saying, I want to die when I choose, when I want to die. Who cares about how it affects a more vulnerable person than me? Who cares how breaking down this fence is going to change society broadly? Now, let's think about the other... The other point about why we should say no to euthanasia will promote suicide. In Oregon, the suicide rate climbed steadily ever since it was introduced in 1997, and by 2016, it was 5% higher than the USA national average. In Belgium and the Netherlands, we have rising suicide rates over the, over the past decade or two, ever since they legalised it. And in surrounding countries like Austria, France and Germany, 
Look, we have falling suicide rates at the same time. And I wonder what that says to you about the cultural change that occurs. WA already has an above average suicide rate. We have 14.7 suicides per 100,000 people. And that means in WA about 1.9% of all deaths happen because of suicide already. And nationally, we have a slightly, slightly smaller figure, 12.6 um, suicides per 100,000 people. The annual suicide rate in Australia was up 9% in 2017. We had over 3,000 suicides. And what we may see, and the federal government's trying to move on this, through the COVID-19 crisis, we may see even a further uptick in suicides, which would be a terrible thing. But self-harm already in 2017 was the 13 leading cause of death. Thirdly, the other reason why we should refuse euthanasia, its consent will be under attack. Thinking most particularly about the Dutch situation, the Dutch government's 2005 report found that one in seven patients who had been euthanised in the previous year hadn't given explicit consent. They had some kind of advanced care directive or some kind of written thing down there and the doctor hadn't sought renewed written or verbal consent from that patient. And they found those records were inadequate. But unfortunately, what kind of investigation? How many doctors were prosecuted? Pretty much none. We've only had one case, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. In 2015, 431 were killed without consent, according to the Central Bureau of Stats in The Hague. And now, we had a case in 2016 in Holland, in the Netherlands, sorry, where a 17-year-old, 74-year-old dementia sufferer, she had given authorization, written authorization, to be euthanized. And she was, had severe dementia and she, she was going further and further into her dementia. Now, she said often, not now, it's not so bad yet. I don't want to die yet. And then finally, the doctor and the family decided, well, she's not talking anymore and, and we should uh, advance this particular directive that she has. Now, it wasn't legal yet in that country to do it without verbal or written consent at, on, at the moment. But they still went ahead and did it. They held her down, put, poured the poison down her mouth. She was struggling and eventually she passed away. Now they held a tribunal in 2018. They'd ruled initially, doctors acted in good faith. They did the right thing. Even if legally it probably wasn't right, they did it in the right good faith. But then, of course, it's finally in April 2020 this year, it went to the Supreme Court and again the doctor was ruled as it's fine and now we've got a new ruling across the whole country that severe dementia sufferers can be legally euthanised in accordance with a written consent they've given decades ago. So consent is already under attack in these other jurisdictions. What's going to happen here in Australia if we authorise this across our whole nation in many different states? Fourthly, Pandora's box will be open. WA government and Tasmanian proponents have all sought to expand the Victorian example. The draft Tasmanian bill, Michael Gaffney, MLC, he's bringing on a draft, it's probably going to be introduced in September. He has expanded eligible illnesses to a disease, illness, injury or medical condition that is serious, incurable and irreversible and which the patient finds intolerable. So in other words, it doesn't even have to be a terminal condition. You don't even have to have a condition that will will be foreseeable to bring about an uh, early end to your life. It could be any kind of condition. So basically it opens the door to any mental illness, something that's incurable in some way. And it also means in, the, in all of these bills, as I see them across my desk, there's more protection for doctors and less protection for patients because more and more people are requesting that they be included in the criteria. There is no logical basis for refusing to expand the criteria to whoever in society should demand it, including for psychological distress, including for children. In the Netherlands, we already have authorised it for children aged 12 and above. In Belgium, it's basically any child over six. We've had a nine-year-old with a brain tumour, an 11-year-old with cystic fibrosis, a 17-year-old with muscular dystrophy. And this has already been happening in other jurisdictions. The Quebec Supreme Court over in Canada has ruled that there, it, a reasonably foreseeable criterion is unconstitutional. Therefore, you do not need to have a fatal condition, something that's going to definitely lead foreseeably to an early end to your death. Basically, it's open slather. And this uh, Supreme Court ruling still hasn't been challenged. The fifth reason, particularly for WA people, is to think about the Aboriginal community. Uh, 
Senator Patrick Dodson in 2018 said this, there is a desperate need for culturally appropriate palliative care services in regional and remote areas. And he said, where First Nations people are already overrepresented at every stage of our health system, it is irresponsible to vote in favour of another avenue of death. And here's the three quick problems about, for the Aboriginal community. An unspe unspecialised WA nurse practitioner can administer and even determine the mental capacity of an Aboriginal person who has requested assisted suicide or euthanasia. These assisted suicide kits can be legally kept in an unsecured place anywhere in Aboriginal community where anywhere else may be able to access them. And thirdly, in Aboriginal community, language and cultural under misunderstandings may lead to wrongful deaths. So there's some great risks in the Aboriginal community. Now, my second topic tonight is about grace and truth regarding life, about the abortion issue. There's three key points to think about this. Killing an innocent human life is wrong. And I think all of us would agree with that, no matter what your position on abortion is. Secondly, abortion kills an innocent human life. Well, then, therefore, abortion is wrong. Abortion is evil, and we must oppose it. Abortion fails the SLED test. Now, it's a quick acronym to think of. It fails the size comparison, a level of development comparison, environment, and degree of dependence. When you think about size, a toddler is smaller than an adult, yet it has the same human value. Now, an unborn human being is smaller than a toddler, that it still has the same value as a human being. The level of development, again, thinking about a little unborn human being in, in its mother's womb, it has a lower level of development than a toddler, but yet it has the same human value and worth. One third of all 23 weeks, um, babies born at 23 weeks survive to age one. And the youngest baby to ever survive well into uh, later into life was 21 and a half weeks old. We have better and better technology that we can actually bring about um, a prolonged life to people who are born very early on. So that's one thing to think about regarding the abortion stats that we'll now reflect on. Here in WA, we've had over 7,800 abortions last year. And that reflects about 19% of all pregnancies. We've had 562 of those were more than 12 weeks old. So then the great majority happened before 12 weeks. And RU486 and other chemical abortion, induced abortions, are obviously very popular amongst mothers. And in fact, you're more likely to be aborted from a married mother than an unmarried mother, which is an unfortunate fact. The good news is that 26 of pregnancies were aborted in 1998, and that's fallen now in 2019 to only 19%. But still we have on average about one abortion every hour, and that means since 1998 in WA we've had 180,000 babies born um, uh, aborted in the womb. And there's been one late-term abortion per week. That may means greater than 20 weeks gestation. 27 have been left to die in the, um, after being born successfully after a failed abortion, and that's between 99 and 2018. And that's a terrible stat, and the, one of the wonderful things is, according to some pro-life politicians who have been investigating this, the WA coroner, and this is thanks to the good work of Nick Gore and MLC and many others, pro-life um, uh, um, members of parliament, the WA coroner is now investigating all of these babies born alive, born alive and left to die, and what happened and what care were they given. Now, think about this other topic. There's something you may not be aware of. There are aborted fetal cells being used in the development of vaccines. Now, what is required for some live vaccines like rubella, measles, rabies, polymyetis, hepatitis A, chickenpox, and smallpox is it requires culturing using a human cell line. Now, there's many other types of vaccines that only require a chicken or a cow cells fetal cells of some kind that can be cultured in other ways. But the popular and most stable form for some types of live vaccines is using an aborted fetus um, cells. Now, WI38 and MRC5 are two types of um, cell lines. And here, here you see the details. Um, one was born in 1962, um, was uh, aborted in 1962, a nine-week-old little girl. Um, and MRC5 was a 14-week-old boy, and his lungs have been used since 1966 to develop vaccines. And you see the chart there of the different types used, particularly in the US, and many of those vaccines available here in Australia. Now, the, like the, um, 
MMR vaccine, very commonly taken. I took it as a little child. I didn't have a clue that this was derived from human cell lines. So just something to be aware of. There is a chart that's available we can look at. There's other alternative vaccines you can seek to investigate and find out. Contact me if you want to see this chart in greater detail. The other thing is about Planned Parenthood in America have wanted to uh, make money off their abortion industry and they've been selling aborted baby parts for profit. Now, that's far beyond the administrative cost because you look at the, the costing for each of these parts, you know, 22000 for a brain, and they've claimed in court that it was just for administrative um, costs. But, of course, they're making a very, very clear profit making from an evil industry. Now, Daniel Dalidian from the Centre for Medical Progress is the one that's exposed this and he's been brought to court so many times and charged and before quite questionable judges of some kind in America that has very interesting political leanings has made it very difficult to him have to hear a fair case. There are a couple of COVID-19 vaccines in development that use uh, aborted human fetal cell lines. Johnson & Johnson are, are using the PER-C61, which is from a healthy 18-week-old um, baby born in 1985. And Moderna is using HEC-293, which is an aborted baby kidney cells born back in, uh, or, or aborted back in 1972 to produce the protein that will bind on the vaccine. Now, we have an annual rally for life on the issues about of supporting human life. We, we want to say love them both. We love the mother, we love the child, we care for them. Uh, most of the time we would have this, but because of the COVID-19 crisis, we haven't been able to hold it this year. So look out for it later this year, probably in October or November, we're probably going to be holding a rally as restrictions ease. Now, there's also another important point to think about is that sidewalk councillors are one of the last ports of call, uh, places of safety for a woman to go to who's thinking about actually having an abortion. As she goes towards the abortion clinic and on the path there, there's somebody there with a kind smile, with a saying, I have care for you, I want to care for your baby. They're not there out there shouting in that person's face. <clears throat> they don't have a, an, an awful looking picture about what they're about to do to their child. They're just embracing and loving the woman. And here across Australia, every, um, uh, there's a month-long period there from early March to early April when people gather together every day and do it. Otherwise, they would do it on every, once every month or so, just go out there and, and share the love and um, care for the mother. Now, in WA, uh, an exclusion zone bill is coming uh, probably later next year. Because of the COVID-19 crisis, a lot of bills have been um, set aside. But the WA bill is probably was forecast to come later this year. Now, the government is introduced under the pretense that women need privacy and dignity in order to go and kill their child. Let's just put it bluntly here. Um, they, they're proposing, like most other states of Australia, except for South Australia, they need a 150-metre exclusion, exclusion zone around the clinic in order to provide safety for that woman. Now, there's already a Public Order and Streets Act that already gives police every right to say, if you're going to be disorderly, if you're going to cause damage, it be a nuisance, obstruction, or jeopardise the safety of any woman, then we can find you and move you on. But that's not good enough for these abortion clinics. They've been calling up and harassing the police to tell, come down here, make sure you, you're present, but let's produce a, re a police report. But there hasn't been a single charge, a single arrest of any kind being made of any of these sidewalk councillors here in WA. There are no examples of harassment or abuse that the government has been able to produce. They interviewed two abortion clinic directors in their um, government discussion paper, and they alleged anxiety and distress but those, these abortion clinic directors didn't give any actual, actual examples. So here in WA, what may actually happen, as it's already happened in many other states, it's fine for you to pray to end farming, fine for you to protect trees, puppies, sharks, chickens. You can do what you like in public lawful protest, but if you want to just love women and care for them and say, I will present to you another option, sorry, we as a society, according to the government, we want to make that unlawful. You can help women in crisis in other ways too. There's many abortion, um, uh, pregnancy assistance centres across Perth. So as you see, there's one there in East Perth and also in Alamara, Longford, Geraldton, Kalgoorlie and Great Southern, as well as other ones in Albany and Rockingham. You can contact them. You see their websites on the screen. 
So finally, let's think about this. God's people are a refuge. From all of these tremendous troubles that people are going through, Christians must be prepared to minister to the wounded, the refugees of the secular moral revolution, whose lives have been wrecked by its false promises of freedom and autonomy. And women have tremendous abortion regret and depression and anxiety after killing their child. And we as Christians need to be prepared to be there as their rescue landing place before or after this act happens. When people are persuaded that they are ultimately disconnected, atomistic selves, their relationships will grow fragile and fragmented. Those around us will increasingly suffer insecurity and loneliness. And Nancy Piercy in Love Thy Body, she continues her quote and she says, The new polarisation can be an opportunity for Christian communities to become safe havens where people witness the beauty of relationships reflecting God's own commitment and faithfulness. Now, Family Voice has been producing things like this, these, paper, these uh, magazines that can help equip you. Um, we're talking about um, standing for life, standing for freedom, particularly amongst the present crisis right now. And you can see some of the stories there and on the thing we've... Uh, um, January edition, we talked about the exclusion zones thing and that, how that would affect us as a society and why it's completely unnecessary. Thinking about the Queensland elections coming up later this year, and then also thinking about the LGBT transgender inquiry that we'd love to see the National Government Institute. Um, Greg Hunt has been pressured by the activists to say no to this, and now we would like to see some kind of national um, proper inquiry being made. So you can read more about that in our publications. Contact me or go to our website, familyvoice.org.au, to get more information.